Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Sinead Lucy, and I am head of the Business Development Unit here at the Royal College of Physicians. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all online today to our webinar on international residency opportunities. Before we start, I'd like to advise that we will record this webinar and a copy will be made available to you. Any questions should be directed directly to the Q&A box within the Zoom function and we'll endeavor to answer as many as possible during the live webinar. Any unanswered questions will be answered directly after the webinar has closed. Today, you will hear from a range of speakers from our academic and support staff and our current and past trainees of the International Residency Programme. Our uh, International Training Programmes Manager, Tam Tracy, will provide you with an overview of RCPI and its residency training programmes. Denise Healy, the Centre Director from Castell Education, will give you an overview on relocation supports to Ireland. And Professor Michael O'Neill, who are delighted to join us today, is going to give you an overview of the residency programme in paediatrics. Finally, um, there is a very valuable panel discussion at the end on relocation, training and living in Ireland. And that will be chaired by Temsha Tracy and we'll have uh, Professor Michael O'Neill, Dr Ali Kashab, who is an Institute of Medicine graduate. And um, thank you so much for joining us today, um, Dr Ali. And also Dr Asma Miliani, who is a current trainee on our programmes. Um, Denise Healy, our Centre Director at Castell Education, and Dale Finnerty, a valuable team lead on our international programmes, will complete the panel discussion. While our role in society has undergone profound changes since our foundation in 1654, the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland remains first and foremost a college dedicated to transformative medical education and training. As the largest postgraduate medical training body in Ireland, we are committed to helping doctors and healthcare professionals enhance their skills and competencies and become leaders in healthcare through advocacy, influence, expertise and support. We are a forward-thinking and dynamic organisation that is recognised nationally and internationally for excellence in medical education. You're invited to join a globally active community with 13,000 doctors in our international network. This shared expertise and global community allows us to develop and deliver an excellent training experience to you. It also offers great opportunities for you to network, to collaborate globally, and to develop your healthcare leadership skills. In recent years, the college has welcomed partnering with healthcare organizations from all over the world to develop and provide postgraduate medical training for doctors seeking training opportunities abroad. We have welcomed over 180 doctors onto our international residency and clinical fellowship programs in Ireland. Our programs offer opportunities to international medical graduates to develop these valuable clinical skills and have an exchange of experience with a clinical team in Ireland. I will now hand you over to Tamsha Tracy, who will further provide you with an overview of RCPI and its international residency programme. I thank you very much for giving up your time to be with us here today, and I do hope you enjoy the webinar. And thank you, everybody. My apologies again for the slight delay there. To begin, I'd like to give you a little bit of background information into Ireland itself. Um, so as many of you will know, Ireland is a small island in northwestern Europe and home to just over 5 million people. We enjoy a mild but very changeable climate and the average temperature here is around 10 degrees Celsius. Ireland is an EU member state using the euro currency and English is the spoken language here, although our native tongue Irish lives on in schools across the country and is still spoken fluently in select areas of the island. We're well connected by air to the UK, Europe, Middle East, North America and other geographies. And we have a safe, friendly, multicultural society with over 35,000 international students from over 160 countries and just under 7,000 international doctors living and working here. The Irish economy is a highly developed knowledge economy focused on high tech, life sciences, financial services and agribusiness and has regularly been ranked first for attracting foreign direct investment over the last decade. 
As I'm sure you'll also know then, Ireland is also internationally recognized as a center of excellence for postgraduate medical training. So as Sinead mentioned, the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland was established in 1654 by Royal Charter. And today we offer not just postgraduate medical training, but also specialist exams, professional competence schemes, continuing professional development, clinical leadership programs, research, quality improvement and assurance programs, and policy and advocacy with both a national and an international impact. In Ireland, postgraduate medical training is divided up by discipline, and RCBI is the oldest and largest of the postgraduate medical training bodies here, housing six distinct training bodies responsible for delivering training in the specialties and subspecialties of medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, pathology, public health medicine, and occupational medicine. We are a truly global college with approximately 13,000 trainees, members, and fellows across 90 countries worldwide. At our CPI, we provide postgraduate specialist training at a core and higher level across 36 specialties. We have two national and two international training programs. On the national schemes, we have basic specialist training and higher specialist training. And within the international programs, we have residency and clinical fellowship programs. The international programs have been developed based on the national programs and are very similar in terms of structure and content, but there are some key differences, um, such as program duration. Mm. Our residency program offers hands-on clinical training at a higher level to doctors who are post-internship. These programs are three years in duration and are available <laughs> in medicine or pediatrics. Trainees will complete structured rotations across different specialties and hospitals within Ireland, as well as completing the membership exam, the MRCPI exam as part of their program. Certificates are recognized for registration purposes as a specialist in our graduates' home countries. However, doctors do of course have to meet all of the stipulated requirements for their specific country and specialty to register as a specialist there. All of our specialist training programs are made up of four core elements, the clinical or hospital-based training, the procedural or practical skills, the core academic program, and the annual evaluation of progress. So within the clinical or hospital-based training, doctors complete the clinical requirements outlined in their curriculum. They participate in ongoing teaching under the supervision of their consultant trainer and their clinical team and they track and record their progress using an electronic portfolio or an e-portfolio. Within their clinical practice, trainees progress from supervised to independent completion of procedures, and they receive feedback via competency-based assessments, such as a direct observation of procedural skills or DOCS, or a mini clinical exercise. So trainees complete mandatory and non-mandatory courses where they learn about leadership, communication, ethics, research, and clinical audit methods. And they also attend national and international conferences. Each year, trainees participate in a formal evaluation completed by an RCPI interview panel, where their progress is assessed against the curricular requirements for their specialty and their satisfaction of competency-based outcomes. Each program is governed by a program director who designs the program curriculum and is responsible for recruitment and selection to the program. The program director assists in the induction of new trainees and annually assesses their progress, as well as providing support to trainees and their trainers as is needed throughout the year. So you'll be hearing shortly, as you know, from our program director for the residency program, Professor Michael O'Neill, who will be able to share further details on the residency program with you. Each program is also has a dedicated clinical tutor who provides online tutorials on the membership part one exam for doctors that have been offered a place on the program. They also provide online or in-person tutorials for the MRCPI part two written and clinical for trainees that are already on the program. And crucially, they also support our incoming trainees in terms of orientation to the Irish health system. 
We understand that moving to a new country, culture and healthcare system can be a very exciting prospect, but also that it comes with significant challenges. And we, along with our partners at Castell Education, are committed to ensuring that our trainees and their families have all of the support that they need during the initial move to Ireland and for the duration of their time here. There is a comprehensive support structure in place for our international trainees, including English language tutoring, relocation support, a dedicated program coordinator and program management team, health and well-being supports, and much more. As you know, you'll be hearing shortly from our colleague Denise Healy, Director of Castell Education, and she'll be giving you an insight into the supports available from an English language relocation and registration point of view, which are complementary to all of our incoming trainees. In terms of the application timelines then, we will open for applications tomorrow on the 22nd of September and close in three weeks time on the 13th of October. Interviews will be held across the end of November and into December with offers issued across December of this year and January 2023. Our new intake of trainees onto the residency programme will start in post then in January 2024. So from tomorrow, a link will be live on the RCPI website for anyone that wants to apply to our residency programmes. And it will also be emailed to attendees of this webinar today. In terms of the recruitment and selection process itself, once the online application form is complete, there's an eligibility check completed by the team here in RCPI, followed by formal shortlisting completed by the program director of the specialty in question. All applicants are then contacted with the initial outcome of their application and interviews are scheduled for those applicants moving forward in the recruitment and selection process and those interviews would take place either virtually on Zoom or in person in our partner countries. Following interview, all, all interview candidates will be contacted then with the outcome of their application. So there are some entry requirements that must be met ahead of application and some that can be met later before a doctor starts training in Ireland. At the time of, of application, a doctor must have completed their primary medical degree through English. And they must have completed or be nearly complete with a structured internship. They must have professional, sorry, provisional sponsorship by a government body with whom RCPI has an agreement in place to provide this training. And they must also have an appropriate level of clinical experience as determined by the program director for that specialty. Um, at interview, if an applicant has the full English language requirement and confirmed sponsorship, as well as potentially having part of the membership exam or an equivalent exam, they might be given preference um, at, at the time of interview, but those aren't requirements for application or for interview. To commence training in Ireland, those doctors that did not have the full English language requirement or confirmed sponsorship must have those. And they must also have one of the additional exams listed um, on the screen here to register with the Irish Medical Council. So as you'll see, there are a number of different exams that are accepted by the Irish Medical Council for registration purposes. But because the membership exam is a requirement for completion of the residency program within our CPI, we'd always recommend that our incoming trainees would take the part one membership in either medicine or pediatrics, depending on the program that you're joining, um, so that you can join Ireland already having completed one of the three parts that will be necessary to successfully complete your program. And also then it's just important to remember that any of the incoming trainees that don't yet have the English language requirement or the part one membership requirement would receive tutoring in both of those areas. So we're often asked um, what makes a standout application and really a CV and online application that's well structured and, and includes a detailed overview of education, training and experience to date is a strong start. We also like to see that all supporting documents have been attached that the applicant has demonstrated an interest in their chosen specialty, and that might be through courses that they've attended or research projects that they've been involved in. 
that they've demonstrated where they have experience in their chosen specialty and potentially through their internship or post internship. Um, we also like to see full details of any research activities that you've undertaken, any audit or quality improvement projects that you've been involved in, and that you might have the part one of the Irish membership already or an equivalent exam. But we always say don't worry if you don't yet have part one of the membership or extensive experience in your chosen specialty. A well-structured CV and application really is the key here to a strong application. So thank you for your time. I hope you found this information helpful and you'll be getting further insights into training in Ireland and into the supports available through Castell Education from my colleagues, Professor Michael O'Neill and Denise Healy, before we begin the panel discussion and answer some of, your, and some of the questions that have been going into the question and answers section. I'm sure you're all really looking forward to hearing from our trainees and graduates of our programme as well. For now, I'm going to hand you over to Denise Healy, Centre Director of Castell Education, who's going to take you through the supports available with Castell. So thank you, Denise. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I'm just going to turn on my camera now. Great. Um, my name is Denise Healy, and I am Centre Director of Castell Education. Uh, this session is going to focus on some of the relocation services that we provide to the Royal College of Physicians and their incoming doctors to Ireland. So um, just to give an overview of this session, I'll give a brief um, overview of Castell Education as an organisation. I'll talk you through some of Castell's services to our CPI doctors and give an insight into a typical doctor journey with Castell and the various stages that you go through and the supports that we provide to you. And then I'll speak about the English language tuition provided and a summary of the various services and supports we provide. So just a brief overview of Castell Education. Uh, we were established in 2011 as a leading provider of undergraduate pathway programs in medicine and allied healthcare in Ireland. We directly supported over 1,500 um, undergraduate and postgraduate students um, transition to Ireland. Uh, we are founding partner of the International Medical Commencement Program, uh, which uh, provides transition for Middle Eastern students to study medicine in Ireland. And we provide intensive English language programs to support undergraduate and postgraduate students reach their targeted linguistic um, results to study and practice in Ireland. Uh, in 2021, we were acquired by Cambridge Education Group, which is a global company with their headquarters in the UK, and they provide um, educational programs throughout the world. So here are some of Castell's um, undergraduate and postgraduate partners in Ireland. So our mission is to facilitate, facilitate undergraduate and postgraduate um, candidates to acquire the English language competencies which enable them to enter their chosen allied health program or specialization in Ireland. We aim to deliver an outstanding transitional and learning experience in an engaging and supportive environment. Um, our ob objective is to ensure that the services we provide to national and international stakeholders both academic and non-academic meet the highest possible standards. And speaking of standards, we have many quality um, accreditation marks for the provision of English language services. So we have a national quality mark of ACELS and a European quality mark of equals for the provision of our English language services to undergraduate and postgraduate students. We are also an OET uh, provider. So all of our tutors have the knowledge badge for tutoring OET to allied health professionals. 
Uh, Castel provides services to all of the postgraduate training bodies within Ireland. So we assist uh, doctors who want to transition to Ireland to specialize in these various specializations from these postgraduate training bodies in Ireland. But our main partner is the Royal College of Physicians and the majority of the doctors we support are from RCPI. So I suppose the scope of the service we provide to incoming doctors um, is that we have a team of experienced professionals who provide tuition and support to international doctors. We assist with every step of the journey and I will speak about these stages uh, in more detail in the next slides, um, from meeting English language requirements to your medical council registration and to support with securing accommodation and schools and childcare if required for family members. It is our mission to ensure that all doctors have a smooth transition to Ireland we are focused on ensuring doctors can concentrate on their education, training and professional development while everything else is taken care of to ensure that you have a stress-free transition to Ireland. So our services allow more time for trainees to immerse themselves into Irish life and culture while everything else is taken care of. So a typical trainee journey with Castell, the first stage is meeting your English language requirements if you have not yet met them. So for IELTS, it is an overall seven with no skill less than 6.5 and for OET, a minimum B in each of the four skills, listening, reading, writing and speaking. So we provide tuition to doctors for six to eight weeks um, depending on what deficits they have in particular skills. And then when a doctor has met their English language requirements and all of their other academic requirements for RCPI, um, we, they are referred to Castell team who work with them to support them with their medical council registration and the various steps associated with the documentation required for their medical council registration. And there are some, there are various steps involved here that can take up to 10 weeks. And we provide support in each of those stages. And then uh, doctor moves on to stage five, which is um, application for their work permit. And this can take up to two weeks. And when that is acquired, the doctor can apply for their visa application. And again, we provide support there and we communicate with the embassies to prioritize a processing if there is a delay. But at the moment, visa application is taking two to four weeks. And after that, um, a doctor is ready to book their flights and we advise on um, the best time to do so. And then when a doctor arrives in Ireland, we provide ongoing in-country supports um, for settling in and setting up in Ireland. So in terms of the English language tuition, if a doctor has met their IELTS or OET requirement and does not require English language tuition, they are referred to um, the head of postgraduate services who uh, works with them on um, the relocation services. Um, if a doctor wants to maintain their English language or practice conversational skills before transitioning to Ireland, we can provide this maintenance English uh, classes too. Um, but if a doctor is short in one skill for IELTS or OET, we can provide up to six weeks one-to-one -one online tuition to prepare them for their particular exam. And if a doctor is short in two or more skills or does not have any experience in IELTS or OET, um, they can avail of up to eight weeks one-to-one -one tuition with a professional tutor. Um, so if a doctor um, is unfortunate and does not meet their English language requirement, we will continue working with them um, to provide linguistic support in preparation for their exam. 
So uh, just to summarize the Castell support, as I mentioned, the first step is um, online language tuition, and we devise a learning needs analysis with um, each doctor before we assign a professional IELTS or OET tutor. Uh, we provide one-to-one -one live classes, and we give access to OET or IELTS practice tests and give continuous feedback and a correction service um, to the doctor in preparation for their exam. After that, the doctor moves to medical council registration, and this is a guided process, um, including EPIC, and they are provided with draft application previews up until final submission. And then the next step is the immigration services and supports, uh, where a doctor applies for atypical working scheme letter, visa application. If a doctor is moving to Ireland with family members, we assist with their visa application. And when in country, um, we advise on IRP appointments and re-entry visas for children's, children or spouses, or if third country visas are required, we also provide advice and support on how to acquire those. So that's um, a summary of the initial supports. And then upon arrival to Ireland, Castell arranges an airport pickup for each doctor. Um, and this is sometimes in Dublin or outside Dublin. Um, so we schedule a coach um, and to pick up the doctor and transport them to their temporary accommodation. And we provide each doctor with a welcome information pack that has um, a lot of information about banking and living and settling in Ireland. And we also provide 24 seven telephone support upon arrival. And also the day after arrival, we schedule a video call with each doctor to um, establish accommodation preferences and to give information about living and working in Ireland. Um, so after arrival, uh, doctors uh, give us their preferences about accommodation. We liaise with estate agents, letting agents, and we uh, provide information about permanent accommodation options. And we set up viewings for each doctor uh, to view preferable accommodation options. And we review leases before signing, um, et cetera. So all of the advice on moving into permanent accommodation. Then the ongoing support, I suppose, if a doctor is moving to Ireland with their family members, they may require information about schooling or childcare. And we establish those requirements prior to arrival. And usually schooling and childcare is either close to the accommodation or the workplace of the doctor. So um, we work with the doctor to establish uh, your preferences um, on location of schools or childcare facilities. Um, and we arrange appointments for um, schools and childcare facilities too. We provide information on day-to-day -day issues in relation to opening bank accounts, mobile phone options, broadband for your permanent accommodation, health insurance, and car rental if required. Um, in your information pack upon arrival, there is information about prayer facilities, health care centre, transport facilities, and ethnic food shop. Um, and then we, when the time is up, when you're here for two to three years, we provide advice on departure, move out advice, and also relocation advice. Um, if you're relocating from different clinical settings within Ireland, we again provide support with accommodation. So uh, 
In terms of accommodation, the various steps in the process is um, submitting an application on a preferable accommodation option. Uh, the agent then reviews the application with the landlord. We schedule a viewing between the doctor and the landlord, and um, we advise on the payment of deposits, and usually it's a first month's rent, um, and we also review the lease and the contents of a lease agreement and advise on that. And then hopefully handover of keys would take place. So that's a typical process with accommodation securing in Ireland. Um, when you are in country, uh, we provide ongoing support on a daily basis. Um, this support is in relation to IRP card renewals, rotations to new clinical sites, as I mentioned, and finding new accommodation, um, any educational requirements for you uh, or your family members, third country visas, family visas or re-entry visas for family members, medical council registration renewal, and end of program move out advice um, again. So that is a summary of Castell education relocation supports that we provide to RCPI incoming doctors. Um, if you have any questions about the English language tuition or the relocation supports, I am happy to answer them. Thank you and um, enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much, Denise. You're going to hear now from Professor Michael O'Neill, Consultant Pediatrician and Program Director of the RCPI Residency Program in Pediatrics. Thank you, Professor O'Neill. Thanks very much. Um, I decided on this occasion that I wouldn't use slides and I would actually talk to you a little bit about the program as we've experienced it. When trainees come to us, the first question we ask them is, what is training? And I know for most of you think it's about, oh, I'll develop skills and I'll be able to do this and that. But actually training is about creating a newer way of thinking that's going to sustain you all the way through your working life. So those initial few years are the groundwork that you require that will develop the habits that were formative and that you will continue on. If you fail to de develop those habits, uh, life in medicine and especially in pediatrics will be incredibly stressful. So several years ago when this opportunity came about, about developing this program, um, I had the ability to look back and think, what are all the things that I wish I had at the time when I was going through that would have made my life a lot easier? So in my experience, I emigrated to Canada with family and unlike the Castell supports, which you've just heard nicely outlined, we landed in Canada, we were on our own, and we started a process or a journey that took up to uh, 13 years in our particular case. So when I was looking at this program, I was saying, I have got three years, and we can actually put in place the things that would be of great benefit. So we decided to get a very unique or bespoke program. And part of that is how programs are structured. So in Ireland, <clears throat> for the standard BSD, basic specialist trainee, they do two years and then they will do six months um, neonatology, six months subspecialty and a year general pediatrics for the majority. And then they will get their exams and they will apply onto HST. And then they will spend five years in HST and then they will come out with what is called their CSCST. And for most, they will have to do further fellowships in order to get a consultancy post in Ireland. So when we were looking at this program, in pediatrics, the undifferentiated child who comes in with undifferentiated symptoms is the biggest challenge because that child might have a viral syndrome or might have something that's going to be a catastrophic illness for them. So the program starts off with eight months outside Dublin in one of the designated four units, which are chosen because of the trainers who are present there. And during that time, the trainee sees undifferentiated pediatric conditions, does call, which in pediatrics is an absolute essential element of training, uh, does clinical work in outpatients, 
and then does some subspecialty work. And then at the end of that eight months, everybody will relocate to Dublin and they will do four months neonatology as an SHO in one of the designated maternity hospitals of which there are three. When they've completed that process, they have a year under their belt. And at that stage, there's 15 months. And during that 15 months, they will rotate through five subspecialty rotations. Again, some of these are chosen because of the needs of the doctors who will return to the Middle East, and that includes metabolic disease. However, they have the options of doing neurology, endocrinology, cardiology, and gastroenterology. And in pediatrics, we always think of neurology, cardiology, uh, and endocrinology as, as the big subspecialties because you're going to be exposed to a lot of these children and you need to know how to manage them. At the end of that time, you will have nine months left and you will spend three months as a specialist registrar in neonatology in the maternity hospital that you did your neonates. And then after that, you will return to your base hospital for six months and function as a specialist registrar. So in that three years, we expect you to have seen a large volume of patients. We expect you to be able to make uh, good initial assessments of patients, formulate treatment plans, and be able to defend your treatment strategies. And how do we develop this process? Well, part of what is different about this program is um, it has a, a tutor. So that tutor is to aid you in the processing part one, part two, and part three of the membership. And while I would say to every candidate, passing the membership is an essential part of progressing in this program. And we, we have installed that as a core element because all members of the International Residency Training Program are compared against the average Irish trainee. Not the best, not the weakest, but those in the middle. So you know the bar at which you are, are being measured against. The tutor in this program, in this case, it's Dr. Dr. Mojahid Elbadri. He actually has uh, finished his pediatric program. He's originally from the Sudan, and he knows the cultural adaptations that are required. He's an exceptionally talented educator, and he will know the tips and tricks to facilitate your exam. But we don't want you as a trainee in the International Residency Training Program to be isolated. So what we have done is that while you have specific times with Dr. El Badri, the, the study days for the basic specialist training program of which there are eight a year, you will be an active member of those and an active contributor. And the days are actually designed to elicit um, the assessment of clinical cases in the morning or discussing about issues that are particularly important for trainees. And I would say to you is that distress or stress in the workplace, de dealing with challenging parents, dealing with difficult cases, difficulties within the work environment, those issues can be discussed and you can get peer support. Plus you can also meet other trainees. And in the afternoons of those days, we have subspecialists who come in who give mini seminars on the current issues are important topics in their subspecialty. And this allows the trainees to get a sense or a feeling or an understanding of current important issues. In the training program, assessment of progress is absolutely essential. And this is a, a two-way street. Trainers expect the trainee to formulate their goals and objectives. And in this process, you are saying, what do I want to achieve? What is practical? And how will I know that I have achieved it? The trainer would be able to tell you, you have achieved this goal and that goal. And, and what we have actually found so far is that because we've chosen our trainers very carefully, they can give us excellent feedback on the strengths and the weaknesses of trainees and areas that would be helpful for them in their future roles. Or they may well say, you know, this person has a particularly ability in this area, have they thought this as a subspecialty career? The logbook now is electronic and it is matched to a curriculum. So at this point in time, the International Residency Training Program curriculum uh, is being adapted and matched to it. So that when you see a clinical case, you can put in the clinical uh, events, 
that were important to you. And then you can read around the topic and then with your trainer discuss it. What we actually find within the training process now, uh, and we are modifying this in, within the college in general, we're very, we feel that the post-call ward round is really important, that specific education within the clinic environment after the events is important, but also the trainee reading up about quality improvement, patient safety, risk events is important. And what we have also understood is that trainees amongst our own grouping are quite concerned about the safety environment in which they're working. One of the things that <clears throat> trainees say to us is, um, what am I going to be able to do at the end of three years? So for us, three years allows us to say that we have trained a person who has got a good grounding in general pediatrics, who has passed their exam, and in our view, are on the way to developing their career in pediatrics. So what you might have found if you look at careers in North America, or programs in North America that have a three year or four year residency program, those programs are designed to, to train and develop primary care pediatricians. Our program is not looking at that grouping. They're looking at hospital based consultants who ultimately will have their work environment within secondary or tertiary care. Again, people make comparisons to the North American process, but the fellowship programs in North America uh, per se are so-called academic, which are three years, and then the general programs, which are two years. If I was thinking about um, the program in Ireland, and I was looking through the exposure that I would have, what I would, what I'd be most pleased about is that there are selective courses developed to enhance me as a professional. So there is leadership courses, there's ethics courses, there are prescribing courses. So in these areas, I'm developing a skill set that's specifically designed to say, you are competent in this area. The phase of simulation is now in, in developing in Ireland, and perhaps it's not as advanced as it is in North America, but it is certainly getting there. And also within uh, our process, what we find is that the uh, collegiality that international trainees develop is actually quite strong. Pediatrics is actually noted for it being friendly, it being inclusive, and also allowing people to have positive experiences and to look into areas they're interested in developing. So should you have an area that you want to develop in a subspecialty area, say you, you have an interest in, oh, I don't know, something like rheumatology, we could arrange a three month rotation for that as a specific rotation for trainees with specific interests. And what we are finding is that that is the way of the future that people are now thinking that they would like to develop a subspecialty areas. The role of the tutor for us is important. And when I, as I am a trainer myself and I am part of the BST training program, our trainees say to us, why can doctors from Saudi Arabia, why do they have this bespoke program that we don't have? And what we can say to them, it's very simple. Well, they're not from, they're Irish, so they have to go through the Irish process. I think if you look carefully at this program, it can meet the needs of a lot of what a trainee requires in their early years. And I do think it's inclusive in that it looks at the needs just beyond the medical component. It looks at the social adaptation. It looks at the cultural inclusion as well. I think I'd be interested in taking any questions that people have on this program, which will undoubtedly will grow from strength to strength. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor O'Neill. I'm going to hand you over now to Dr. Asma Malyani. Asma is in her final year of training on the residency program in pediatrics, and she's going to share some tips with those of you that are thinking about applying to the residency programs. So thank you, Asma. Thank you very much, Tamsha, um, and thanks, Professor. That was actually very, very helpful. It covered a lot of the things that I would have wanted to know before coming onto the program. Um, so this program has been very special, and I think that I've learned a lot on it um, and I didn't just learn from a medicine aspect but I also learned from a life aspect and I think that's what also provides this program with with special kind of features and what makes it so 
um, strong in that sense. My main advice, I think, looking back at a little over two years during this program was that the best thing that I've learned, um, one of the best things that I've learned in this program is how important teamwork actually here is in Ireland. Um, and it's like anything that you think about in your life. It, you give as much as you get. So if you cooperate with your um, colleagues, with your, um, with your consultants, and when you think about yourself as part of something bigger and not just about yourself, a tunnel vision about your training, when you think yourself as part of a, of a team, of an approach that helps you learn better and that helps facilitate so much um, and make things so much easier for yourself, not just for the team itself, because when a whole team succeeds, you succeed with it. But if you think of yourself as an individual and just about your training needs, then you set yourself apart and you might fall short um, from learning some of the things that you could have learned when you when you look at things from a bigger picture. I think it's a great opportunity to look not just about um, not just on evidence based medicine, but also about how different um, people approach different things about different cultures about different um, approaches and I think that's very very valuable and when you bring that experience because if we're being honest medicine is medicine no matter where you go but what makes you stand out what makes you special is when you bring something extra to the table when you bring an additional experience an additional point of view to the table and that makes you unique and um, that's the whole point about going abroad and, and trying to get training abroad because you get that extra view and perspective that you wouldn't have if you were just like all of your peers training locally you know they all have been through the same thing you would learn the same medicine you would learn great evidence-based approaches but you would have an additional experience in some way different and you can compare and contrast and take the best out of that and bring that to the table and that can make you stand out and it can be very appreciated and I know this because I went back home in the middle of my training and I saw how appreciated those additional skills and perspectives and how people were more willing to listen because it was something different and um, be kind in all your interactions be 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 friendly and be courteous and facilitate others because they will facilitate you that way and that is that is a gold advice that's a golden advice that I would give to think of yourself as part of something bigger and not just kind of focus on yourself alone I think that would help you very much in this training set yourself up to a high standard and try to meet that and you will reap the benefits you will see that everyone here is very friendly they're very accommodating they're very, they will facilitate your career goals and your training needs. Um, but you do get you do get as much as you give and then try to, to work both ways and try to be flexible and try to, to be realistic in, in what you're when what, what you're demanding. Like you're already given so much benefits and so much advantages by being facilitated with a tutor, which a lot of the Irish trainees don't have. And, it, and it's very, very helpful. It helps blend you in and it helps you understand um, things that might that you might have not had the opportunity and the ability to learn locally. So it helps you fit in and it helps you blend in and settle in much quicker. And it also helps immensely with passing all your exams. I, I was very fortunate to have um, my tutor who was was very helpful in so many aspects. Um, so you're already given so many advantages, appreciate that and show that in your work and cooperation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my advice um, to any person who's considering this program. Um, thanks very much. That's really useful advice, Asna. Thank you very much for sharing all of that. I'm sure that we're going to have a number of other questions for you as well as, as we progress now. We're going to move on to the, the question and answers section of our discussion today. So I'm going to invite everybody to turn back on their cameras. Um, and then I have some questions that have come in through the inbox and some questions that were submitted ahead of time. And I'll direct those to you then and you can unmute as you go. Um, so 
As you'll know, we are joined in this session by our speakers that you've already heard from. So Professor Michael O'Neill, um, the Program Director of our Residency Program in Pediatrics. Dr. Asma Malyani, who's in her final year of training on the Residency Program in Pediatrics. Denise Healy, Centre Director for Castell Education. Dr. Ali Kashab, Ali is one of the first graduates of our residency program in inter internal medicine and is currently undertaking a fellowship program in cardiology at, at McMaster University in Canada. And um, we have Dale Finity, the team lead of our program coordinator team that manages and coordinates our the international training programs for our CPI. So Dale and the team are a huge support to our international trainees and um, our experts as well in the in terms of the international programs. So thank you all for coming back and joining us for this. I'm going to take a look at the questions that are coming through. And Professor O'Neill, I'm going to direct the first one to you, if that's all right. So we have, a question. Thank you. we have a question here where someone has asked if there are any age restrictions on applying for these programs. Uh, no, that there's no age restrictions per se uh, on applying to the program. Uh, what I would say is that when people are looking at it, uh, they need to look at where they are in their uh, career and look at the impact it would have on relocating. So, so th those are the two things. Certainly the younger you are, the more flexible you can be. The older you are with family, children in school, the more difficult it is, but there are no age restrictions. Thank you, Professor O'Neill. Dale, I'm going to direct this next question to you. And mm -hmm. um, one of our um, participants today has asked if they could apply for subspecialty training after directly after internship. Um, so currently um, for fellowship level, you mean? Yeah. OK, so currently um, the unfortunately, the visa restrictions do not allow this. This is something we are working towards um, and will hopefully have available in the next few years. Um, so unfortunately, not at the minute. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ali Kashab, I'd like to direct the next question to you, if that's all right. Sure. Would you be able to tell us, I have quite a few questions actually for you, Ali, but would you be able to tell us in the first instance about your experience of moving to Ireland and how Castell Education might have supported that transition? Yeah, very good. Uh, Welcome everybody, good morning. Thanks for the opportunity. And I want to emphasize, I agree with everything that Professor O'Neill mentioned about the training itself. Um, just to begin with, I think Castle Education has held me great times in, in terms of finding my way into the Medical Council, into Ireland. It was a bit difficult on my own, but Castle Education has 100% definitely helped me with the kind of the language requirements, you know, registrations with the medical council. So I think it was a big, big issue before coming into Ireland, but Castle Education absolutely helped me through that. So and coming into Ireland, finding an airport pickup, that was a big deal to me. So it was great to have that when you're after a long flight, going into Ireland, have that sorted out for you. And even through that in itself, through the years, they will very, very good in terms of following up with like uh, registrations with the uh, immigrations office, getting an appointment quicker, not being able to sorting that out when you're working, even during COVID. So everything was sorted out just by emailing and uh, uh, they were very, very helpful. So I really, really appreciated that. And I do still appreciate their help with the new new trainees into the program. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ali. Denise, I have a question here where a candidate is asking how they should decide between the IELTS or the OET and which exam would be the exam for them to choose. So what advice do you give to candidates when they're trying to make that decision? Uh, we work closely with um, the trainee um, and we give an overview of both assessments and what's entailed in each. They're very, very different. Um, historically, it, IELTS was the only assessment acceptable by the Medical Council, but OET has become more popular, uh, but uh, seats are less frequent, 
Um, they only have an exam in centers once a month. Um, in contrast to IELTS, IELTS is available now in most centers most days of the week, with the exception of Sunday. Um, so it's more IELTS is more accessible if a doctor is in um, a rush to get here. Um, but we work closely with them, telling them the contrasts in both assessments and which would be suitable for them. Um, so OET is medical orientated, whereas IELTS is more academic English. So there are vast differences. Uh, but at the moment, it's 50-50 doctors choose. And sometimes they prepare for the two exams and they book a date for each and hope for the best. So we work closely with them on their preferences, but initially we give a clear overview of the two assessments. That's great. Thank you, Denise. There's a question here that I'm going to take myself um, where someone has asked if we have a residency program in obstetrics and gynecology at the moment. And at the moment, we don't. We have programs available in pediatrics and internal medicine only. This year, we're looking at introducing other specialties. So we're going to be considering obstetrics and gynecology and also histopathology. Um, but there is no commitment at this time to introduce those programs. We're still going through a review um, period with that. Uh, but I would say to anyone that's interested in those programs is watch this space and potentially this time next year, we will have new programs available. Um, Dale, I'm going to direct this next question to you, if that's okay. So someone has asked what the deadline for submitting the IELTS and the sponsorship is. Um, so maybe if we could tell them how far in advance of their start date, we would want them to have those. Thank you. Absolutely. So um, in terms of the IELTS and sponsorship, really, we'd look, be looking to get with this to get the sponsorship confirmation as soon as possible. Um, but we will um, work with you along the way. And if it's still not in place by the time we're submitting the full Medical Council documentation, um, then we will hold until that's in place. We will work with you um, on that. Um, in terms of the English language, so this is required to move on to the EPIC and um, Medical Council verification stage. So really we're looking for the Medical Council certificates to be issued eight weeks in advance of you starting. And that's because the process is really a linear process. Um, so we would need the Medical Council um, certificate to move on to the atypical, to move on to the visa, in order for you to be able to book your flights. Um, so really to get the, for the English language um, requirements, we would really be looking for you to get them about 14 weeks before your, your start date, 12 to 14 weeks before your start date. And that's really to enable time for EPIC verification, medical council registration, because they, they can be lengthy processes and this is sometimes underestimated. So I would really stress the, the, the length of the process that you you know you need to go through through for for arrival in Ireland. So I hope that 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 is a helpful answer for everyone. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Thank you, Professor O'Neill. I'm going to hand this question to you. So one of our attendees has asked, "How do you assess a resident's overall performance and efficiency in patient assessment and evaluation?" Okay, that's an excellent question. So we have three methods that we actually look at that. One is on the handover process. It's their ability to synthesize the information, uh, stay it in a coherent fashion and come up with a differential diagnosis. And then we have formal assessments then of direct observation of physical examination. And then the last assessment is how they're viewed by the nursing staff, uh, other healthcare professionals on the wards. And that that's really goes back to asthma's point of you know engagement and being friendly and stuff like that. So th those systems quite work quite well. It's important to remember we actually use um, a fairly detailed assessment um, for each trainee. So at the end of um, a three-year program, there would be a letter placed in the trainee's chart outlining strengths and weaknesses, which could be used as a testimonial when they need to go for fellowship programs and stuff like that in North America. So yes, so it's, it's actually a formal process. 
Thank you very much. I have another question for you, Professor O'Neill, if that's okay. So we have a couple of people here that are part of the way through their internship at the moment, and there's there's varying um, levels of completion of the internship here. So there's somebody who's saying they they're still doing their internship. They should be finished by June 2023, and should should they apply this year for the program? Okay, so June 2023 is eight months away. So what I would say to them, yes, they should make an application and then start the, the process. And uh, I, I think that's a useful uh, strategy. Certainly in the Irish trainees, they would be thinking of pediatrics, certainly because we have the interviews uh, in the last day of submission would be in November. We have interviews in February and then they would start in July. So it wouldn't be unusual for somebody to be thinking eight months ahead. So that would be quite normal for us. That's great. Thank you very much. And Denise, I have a question here about the IELTS, where someone has said they completed the IELTS and they, they achieved an overall score of six, but it has now expired. And do they have to take the exam again? Uh, firstly, an overall of six is under the requirement. So the requirement to register with the Medical Council is an overall of seven with no skill less than 6.5. Um, and if a candidate has the requirement, but their um, TRF report has expired, they are obliged to resit another exam so that it is within the two years um, of application. Thank you very much, Denise. Now, there are a couple of questions that I'm going to take myself. Um, there's a question here about if we offer a residency in plastic surgery. And in Ireland, surgery is actually delivered under a separate college to ourselves, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. I know they have international training programs available. As far as I understand it, they are still in the process of developing their residency programs. They have fellowships in place and the residency is under development. But what I would say is if you are interested in surgery, check out the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland's website and you'll be able to see what opportunities are available with them. Someone has asked as well, just around, they're a fresh graduate. Will they require an additional exam such as the PLAB, the MRCP, et cetera, to enter the residency program. And there is a requirement for an additional exam and it's, it's really a medical council registration requirement. So the MRCPI part one is the exam that we recommend you take in either medicine or pediatrics. There are a number of other exams that you'll find listed on our website that would also be acceptable to the medical council. But because you would have to take the full three parts of the RCPI membership anyway as part of your training, we recommend that you take the, the part one before you enter the program. There, so Dr. Ali, I'd like to hand this, this well, I, really this is a question from myself that I think will be useful for everyone to hear about. Um, I would like to hear about how you feel your training in Ireland had prepared you to undertake fellowship training in Canada. So you're completing your fellowship in cardiology in McMaster University at the moment. Um, I think it's just, um, it's important to understand the, the value of uh, obtaining an Royal College of Physician in Ireland certificates of training. And on top of that, you're actually a member of the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland. So you're actually having two uh, certificates upon completion, successful completion of the training itself. And on top of that, you're actually gaining a lot of professional development skills and being able to interpret, co conduct research and uh, other, other skills that would really enhance your CV. So putting everything together and applying into fellowships all over the world I think that will make you an stand out applicant. Uh, on top of that, 
one of the things that I think people in this uh, attending this webinar should really, really get that perspective that when you finish the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland and you obtain the certificate, you're actually accredited in, in Canada. You are actually acknowledged as a training facility or as a training certificate compared to other, uh, when I, if I was trained at home. Uh, so my certificate of residency is actually accredited by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada. So that's a big, big push, being able to obtain such a certificate from Ireland. Um, the other thing I think is it's uh, one of the greatest opportunities that I've had into the residency training that I had in Ireland was, is the ability to do a focused area of my interest with the conjunction of and the guidance of the college and my program director, Dr. Sherian, back then. So when I when I successfully conducted the MRCPI certificates, I was honored and happy to do very very uh, intensive uh, cardiology training in Ireland, and that helped me through getting the job that I have at the moment because I've had lots of experience during my residency training in cardiology and that really made me stand out application compared to Saudi peers uh, who have conducted their residencies in, in, in Saudi. So I think it's, it's an important uh, positive thing in the program. And I'm more than happy to answer if, if there's any other questions here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Dr. Asma, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the about actually living in Ireland, about um, how you found the, the social elements of, of living here? Um, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I don't know how to elaborate on that, but I, I, I like I was obviously as if when, when you're moving to a different country um, for the first time, this is my first time ever living abroad. Um, and on my own as well. So obviously there were challenges um, that accompanied that, but I think I was very lucky and I think it would have been much harder if I were somewhere else. Um, my family actually helped um, helped me settle in the first couple of weeks I came to Ireland and most of my family members have lived abroad, whether they lived in Germany or the States, different um, countries and like different states in the States. <laughs> um, and the one thing that kept uh, being reiterated to me is you are very lucky people here are very friendly they're like we haven't encountered any discrimination um, we were able to settle in much easier like much more easily than other places and um, Castel have been very 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 valuable into facilitating that because my family members were also um, scholarship students abroad and they never had anything like that like they were just shocked to find someone you know picking us up at the airport and helping us with the rents um, and finding an, app an appointment and all that so we were very supported like I, I consider myself very privileged very very supported um, and all along my training everyone was interested to know about the program and my role in it and people kind of were inclusive and they'd invite you when they'd go out and it's nice because well when I came in there was COVID so that was challenging but once COVID started wearing off a little bit and especially now um, there's a lot of departmental social outings you know so that was great to to make um, you know social connections and friends and meet up with people whatever hospital I went to there were always um, you know black tie events or going out for dinner or you know ice cream or things like that and we'd go as a department and as a group so it really helped um, settle in from a social point of view that's great to hear thank you asma thank you, thank you. so professor o'neill i have a question here um, about the part one membership and what it consists of so someone has has asked is it similar to the mccqe part one or the usmle steps no so it is different. It, it is, it is um, a, a test of pediatric knowledge and of what I'm going to call background knowledge. But if you look at actually the um, essay or the question banks that are available, the past test banks, there's a series of uh, MCQ banks, which gives you an excellent idea as to how the exam is structured. However, the advantage of, of being in the program and having a tutor is the tutor can bring you through the nuances of the question. And 
a lot of people, when we look at the pass rates, those who are living in Ireland, the pass rates are higher than those who are abroad. And it all is to how they read the questions and they understand what's actually being asked. Okay, so, um, but the MCCE, uh, which I've done many years ago and still have to give guidance on, uh, no, it will be different from that. It's all pediatric focused. It's on clinical questions. It can be learned from a book. Unlike part two and part three, but part one, you can learn from a book. Thank you very much, Professor. Denise, I have a question here from a graduate of an Irish university. So they've done their undergraduate medical degree in Ireland, and they're asking, are they exempt from the IELTS requirement if they have done their undergraduate degree here? Yes, uh, they are exempt, um, which is great for them. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Denise. I have a question here as well, just from an applicant that has asked, can they apply when the applications open tomorrow without their IELTS? And I'm going to take that one myself and say, yes, absolutely, you can. You don't have to have the IELTS to apply for this program or to interview for it. You just have to have them ahead of starting in Ireland. And as Dale had mentioned, the IELTS result is required to apply for your medical counsel registration, which in turn is required for your visa application. So it is important to have the IELTS quite a quite far in advance of, of starting here, but you don't have to have it for application or for interview. And if you don't have it, then Castell Education will be able to support with English language tutoring. And I'm going to ask you this one as well, Denise, if that's all right. So we have a candidate with a range of IELTS scores from 5.5 up to 8. And they're asking, is it possible to apply with that or to use that result? Unfortunately, no. Um, a candidate cannot combine certs. Uh, the Medical Council only accepts one sitting. Uh, where a candidate meets the requirement in that one sitting, one certificate. So um, a combination of certificates um, is not acceptable, unfortunately. And in terms of the occupational English test, um, this particular test allows for individual skills sittings, but again, that's not acceptable um, candidates have to meet the B in each scale in one certificate. Brilliant. Thank you, Denise. So, Professor O'Neill, I have a question here about research opportunities within the residency programme. Would you be able to speak to that, please? Yes, there are opportunities uh, to do research and audit within the programme. Uh, and I, I think people who are here in asthma maybe could speak to that because she's actually going through it. There is a lot of other goals and objectives that you have to achieve so you can do it it is difficult most of our trainees do achieve it but i think perhaps asthma you can speak to the time you've had to it because you went through five different subspecialties there are um opportunities to do um research there are more opportunities to do audits which is quality improvement and it is very much valued in your cv to see that you've co contributed to that when you're doing subspecialties and um, you're doing three months so if you're considering a bit more prolonged research projects such as original articles where you'd have to start from scratch by collecting data and going through the ethical approval process Three months might be a bit too short to do it, but there are opportunities to do, to do things such as case reports or case series. And um, you might consider doing or undertaking a research project um, when you're doing the general pediatric um, rotations, because those are a little bit longer, such as six months and eight months. And that might give you a little bit of time, but you'd have to, you know, be very good at organizing your time and make sure that you're um, that you'd get everything, all the data collection, all the data processing and interpretation in time so that you can get the crucial bulk of it done before you move on to the next rotation and try to have a draft written up and discussed with your um, supervisor within the time um, of your rotation. 
ideally it's great if you're already interested um in this um field or in this particular subspecialties and you can do it when you're doing a general pediatric rotation you can do lots of research on general pediatrics or um, if there are consultants who are general pediatricians with special interest then you can do um a more specialized research with them in their special uh, specialist um, field so there are opportunities but you you have to put in a lot of work and dedication thank you Asma. thank you a couple of more questions have come in that i'm just going to take myself here. There's a question, can Castell help us if they secure a residency program through RCSI? And I'm going to say yes to that, although I do say <laughs> to go back through RCSI and they'll be able to give you um, the full details of, of what's available through them. So they're a separate college to ourselves and you'll be able to see what's available through their website. Another question has come in around the cost of the application. So there is no cost to apply for this program. Someone has asked, can they apply without the IELTS? And yes, you can apply without the IELTS. It would be required for you to start your training in Ireland, but not at the time of application or interview. However, if you do have it at the time of application or interview, you may be given preference in terms of offers. Uh, there's a question here around whether we offer a residency program in neurology, and no, we don't. In Ireland, actually, un unlike in the Gulf, we don't provide a residency program in neurology. So um, it, if you're going to pursue a career in neurology in Ireland, you would do your basic specialist training in internal medicine and your higher specialist training then in neurology. Someone has else has asked then how they would get a recording of this webinar today. So we're going to email everyone that attended today um, the link for this recording. It could take a day or two for our comms team to get the recording up on YouTube, but as soon as we have it, we'll send it to you by email and we'll also send the link to apply for the program if you'd like to pursue that. Okay. Um, I think we have come to the we've come to the end of the questions that are in the question and answers box. Um, but what I would say, I, I'm going to finish on one question, but before I do that, I'll say to anyone, if you have additional questions and um, that haven't been answered today, you can email us at internationalaffairs at or cpi.ie and we'll be able to get back to you on, on any of those queries. Um, yes, absolutely, Ali, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you so much. But it's just, uh, I think it's a very, very important for everyone who's uh, uh, considering this, this program is to know that now, if you finish the program, you have no problems after finishing this program to go back to Saudi Arabia and uh, having your registration very, very smoothly. And, um, it's, it's, it's considered in Saudi, it's a type A certificate. So it's, it's when you finish the MRCP uh, residency training, if you go back to Saudi, it's considered type A, and that's equivalent to the Saudi board, American board, and the Canadian board. So that's uh, very, very important. And the other thing is when you finish this program, you're part of the RCPI family. Like I still, until today, I need help or I need any papers from my trainings. I always reach out to RCPI international office and they always reply to me within one day. So that's fantastic support that you get even after you finish your program. And thank you so much for that. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, it, it was great having you with us and it's great to, to be able to stay in contact as well and to hear about how you're getting on in Canada. The final question was actually going to be for you as well. Um, I just wanted to hear about what you miss about Ireland now that you've moved away. Uh, well, a, a lot of things, a lot of things. Uh, having a scone, obviously, one of the <laughs> biggest thing I do miss here. And uh, the other thing, it's the, like literally the environment. The environment in Canada is very, very supportive. I, I still like the environment here in, Canada, in, in, in Ireland, sorry. I, I still like the environment here in Canada and Saudi, but I feel I'm, I'm, I'm with my family at work 
and um, it's a very, very safe environment to learn and shine. There is no, no segregations and it's absolutely uh, comfortable. That's what I can say. And I do miss that. That's great. Thank you very much, Ali. Okay. Hopefully we'll, we'll see you back here soon. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers today. It's been fantastic having you here and sharing your insights around um, postgraduate medical training in Ireland and the services that we can provide um, to our international trainees. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you all for joining us. I hope that the information that you have heard today has been useful. And if you do have any further questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, please reach out to us at internationalaffairs at orcpi.ie and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Thank you very much. <laughs>